Welcome to the Simple Questions Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Carnahan. That was Wildfire by the band Mad Libby. Wildfire is off of their newest album, High Roller. Mad Libby combines the swagger of rock, the ferocity of punk, and big riffs. Mad Libby has rock and roll up against a wall. You can find information about events and music at madlibby.com. M-A-D-L-I-B-B-Y dot com. The question for this episode is, what does it take to be an Olympian? A few things that you'll learn in this episode are the stress with competing at such a high level, a window into an Olympic training regiment, and the amount of commitment it takes to become an Olympian. Our guest for this episode was born in Kansas City, Missouri, is a two-time Olympian, competing in the 2016 Rio Olympic Games and the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games has won a gold medal in the 2020 Olympic Trials, was a bronze medalist in the 2017 World Championship, making him the first U.S. male to medal in discus at the World Championship since 1999, and the third U.S. male to medal in discus at the World Championship ever. An All-American in shot put in discus at the University of Kansas, and lastly, a two-time gold medalist at the Pan American Junior Athletics Championship. I introduce to you Mason Finley. What I can tell you is out of all the guests I've had so far, you are easily the one I would like to upset the least. I would not want to make an enemy out of you in any way, shape, or form. (laughs) Yeah, I'm uh, pretty large. (laughs) Yeah. It helps, though. Helps in the event. Yeah, it it certainly does, I can imagine. And, you know, that is a factor. But I guess what I'm curious is, how did you get started in discus? Yeah, well, my dad threw the discus. He threw at uh, Wyandotte High School. Um, And I remember... I was messing around in his closet and he has this box of medals from when he went to college. He went to the university of Wyoming and I found his yeah box of medals and his disc. Um, and I had no idea what it was. And he was like, Oh yeah, I forgot I did that. And, um, he started me probably when I was about, I would say 11 or 12 years old. We were just throwing in the yard. He made a, he had these two little McDonald's like plastic Frisbees. And he filled them up with sand and taped them together. And that was my first disc for like a year. And um, yeah, we just threw a lot. It was just like father, son, fishing time, you know. And um, we, uh, yeah, that's how I got started. Just throwing with my dad. Really? Wow. Just with some, uh, just makeshift discus right there. Yeah. 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 He wanted to. Uh, we just messing around because I grew up in a small town in Colorado, Salida, and um, yeah, there's uh, lots of outdoorsy stuff to do, but um, it is a small town, and so um, yeah, we just throw in was just something that um, common interest that he and I shared, and yeah, we blew it up, it was awesome. How did you transition from, say, this 11-year-old kid doing that to performing in college to ultimately becoming an Olympian? Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of shifts, a lot, a lot of changes. But, yeah, um, so I did all the other sports, too. I think, yeah, there's like 74 kids in my class, so we could do all the sports we wanted, you know, try everything out. But we always uh, checked in with the disc, like, at least once a week, like on the weekends, and then um all spring and summer is like dedicated to you know five times a day training even at a younger age and um let's see in high school I won I won state my sophomore junior senior year and got the national record um and the discus with like 236 feet and you know that put me um Gave me a lot of looks at colleges, so I uh, eventually picked a uh, University of Kansas, and um, I got runner-up at NCAA's like four times. Very frustrating, but um, 
uh, got my distance up high enough to where I felt like I was on the cusp of I could maybe do this professionally. So I uh, went out to the Olympic Training Center for six months and then came back to Lawrence. Um, and in 2016, I won the Olympic trials, uh, making my first Olympic team. Wow. That's throughout kind of that course, how, as far as professionally speaking, how did you know you could become an Olympian? Kind of what was that moment? Well, there's, um, you know, with track and field, it's like numbers, um, distances, times, you know, so you can see where you're at really pretty easily just by looking at the results. And then there's the Olympic standard to get into the meet. Um, and that can be a time or a distance. And so in 2016, it was 65 meters. And I had hit that mark three times that season. So I was feeling pretty good that I could make the team, not that I could, you know, win get a gold at the Olympics, but just to make it, you know, was a really big deal in 16. And, um, I, uh, the difference just being experienced really, you know, just going to these meets and, um, perfecting the craft. And, um, I think that, yeah, the Olympic trials, when I was able to to actually like settle down and get the winning throw there. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was a great feeling. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just the, the difference that it, that it takes. I don't know. Like I said, I think you just grow up and you just get used to failing so many times that you finally, yeah, get it all to come together. When you, when you say settling, what, what are you kind of referring to? Well, it's easy when you want to throw far, you want to give it everything you got and, you know, blast it, but that never works in the disc. It doesn't like uh, rigid or like violent movements. It has to be really smooth, really long. Um, as you know, being a, a thrower, you know, it's got to all come through your hips. Your arms are just like, kind of like a, like a string, you know, you can't have it tense and it's hard because, you know, this is like a five pound implement basically for, 4.4 and so and you're trying to throw it you know like 220 feet so it takes uh it takes a lot of maturity to like go out there and like um you know i'm going to do this based on the footwork the movement the um the technical aspects but at the end of the day distance is when uh, distance is what wins so um you'll see a lot of people blasting it still <laughs> even adults it it seems like the pressure of those events has to be immense. Um, yeah, I would say like Olympic Games and World Championships, uh, the pressure is pretty crazy because especially with the Olympics, you get one in every four years or one time every four years, sometimes five years. And um, yeah, it just feels like uh, you put all this work into this one moment and it's and on top of that, it's like such a big deal. Like I'm used to like going through my whole year where it's like, you know, you might have your family and friends come to the meets, you know. Um, and so going from like kind of almost feels like field day at, you know, elementary school a lot of the year. And then all of a sudden you get to like this giant stadium with like typically there's fans. There wasn't in any Tokyo, but, um, you know. I remember 16, the stadium was just almost shaking because they were doing the men's 100 at the same time. So Usain Bolt was there and like, man, that, that stadium was packed. It was just a really, really cool experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. What, what other professional events had you competed in leading up to that point, these Olympic Games? Oh, these Olympic Games? Um, yeah. So 2016, I was... Uh, made my first Olympic team. Um, 2017, I was at World Championships and got the bronze medal. Uh, let's see. 19, I was at World Championships in Doha, Qatar. And then, uh, yeah, this year it was, yeah, Tokyo Olympics. How do those other events compare to the Olympics? Um, World Championships is like 
the same competition as world or as Olympic games. It's uh, at least in track and field, we do everything the same. And the only difference is the other sports aren't there. So it's just track, but it's the same competition. You know, I don't know. A lot of, a lot of us see like worlds and Olympic medal medals kind of being interchangeable. The only difference worlds happens every two years. Olympics happens every four. Okay. Now, in preparation for these events, how much time did you spend training? Oh, a lot. I mean, um, it's what I've been doing full time since 2017, I think, or 16, maybe. And so my schedule is pretty, pretty consistent throughout the year. We go six week cycles to a certain lift plyometrics and um like technical practices and so monday wednesday friday i I lift in the afternoon in the morning i i throw and so we'll do different things like throw heavy discs um throw lighter discs and throw different implements like a heavy shot put um or uh, med balls into the wall so we'll change that up and then tuesday thursdays is uh drills in the morning like footwork stuff and then plyometrics in the afternoon so like jumping sprints um quick feet things like that and how how long how many hours a day do you think that takes up um i would say if i do like with everything like rehab um two practices a day it can be between uh four and six hours a day usually Wow. That's, that's a lot. And it sounds like you have various types, different types of training that you do throughout that time. Yeah. Yeah. And so like right now we're taking this month off. Um, but then when we start back up, it'll be like really, really heavy weights and, um, like kind of longer plyo sessions. Um, and then by the end, like let's say world championships next year, by that time, it'll be like, um, not looking to break down my body at a championship time. And so like, uh, practices will be shorter. We're looking for, uh, quality over quantity and yeah. So it's really nice when you get to that point, because practice start being a little kinder. Yeah. You're more focused on that outcome as opposed to the training. Yeah. Yeah. So it is fun. I mean, if I had to do the same thing every day, it kind of feels the same thing, you know, cause it's just one move. It's not really like a game it's just like you have to perform this almost dance kind of a thing and um yeah so it's nice at least that the cycles and things change so i can you know be uh, like excited to be the practice break up the mon- monotony a little bit there yeah definitely for the uninitiated what kind of weightlifting workouts are you doing You know, it's, uh, your core lifts are pretty basic. Everybody, everybody does, uh, you know, squat bench, um, clean snatch, the Olympic lifts. Um, then we get into some weird stuff like sports specific. Uh, we we do, um, deep flies, which is like, we put the bench on like two boxes and get way up and let the, let the, whatever you're doing flies with, like go all the way back behind you and uh, just trying to keep flexibility and that's what's tough too being a big guy and having to like maintain some sort of flexibility (laughs) um and so we work on that stuff there's like a lot of spinny stuff as you can imagine you know doing twists uh like really getting your core strong so you can hold those positions um and then yeah lifting wise it's it's mainly just those four main lifts and then a lot of like kind of almost like dancer lifts. Yeah. Now, how much weight are we talking here? Like on, if we're talking like power clean or like back squat, how much, how much are we talking here? Um, let's see in the back squat last year, I think I got somewhere around 650 pounds, which is pretty decent. There's a lot of like, like shot putters or, like crazy strong man i don't know if you've seen any videos but if you look up 
like Joe Kovacs and his squat videos, it's like, I think this guy's done like 700 pounds for 10 reps. Like it's just, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So uh, a lot of big guys uh, in, in my uh, world and yeah, lifting bigger weights than I. <laughs> that uh, you'd, you'd mentioned kind of earlier, like, you know, those other lifts or exercises you do kind of focusing on flexibility how how much of a challenge is it like you mentioned to maintain flexibility with someone with your stature and strength um it's not too bad when uh, you have I, i've just set a lot of time aside to make sure i i continuously work on that you know whether it just be like just certain stretches at the end of practices and i mean i've been doing it for yeah, since like 2000, professionally since like 2015. So yeah, it's just something that I've got to continuously work on. But yeah, I mean, I think naturally, just because of all the weights that I'm lifting, my body wants to be tight, but you just have to kind of compete, uh, combat against that. Yeah. That uh, what you mentioned plyometric as plyometrics as well as a part of your training routine. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, and so like, that's another, that's usually the harder practices, you know, big, big dude. And, uh, I don't run and jump very well. So I've, I used to blow up the weight room really hard. Like, uh, I used to be really big actually when in college, I came into college at like three forty, and I left college at like four forty. So I got the freshman four or a freshman hundred pounds. And, um, yeah, so I was getting really big in the weight room, but I couldn't move. Like, I couldn't spin very fast. It was very slow, very, very stiff. And so when we started doing more plyos and I got my jumps and sprints up and the body weight started coming back down, um, got, got down to, like, uh, 330 pounds. So that was nice. Nice relief on my knees. And then um, that's where my distance started getting into um, where I could, like, compete against – top athletes in the world is when I started getting better at the stuff I sucked at. So yeah, what, what, um, what impact does weight have on an athlete? It's, it's, uh, everyone's kind of different, right? And so that's what I, one of the things I really love about the disc is of course, you know, I, I think I have like a seven, two wingspan and all of that stuff, uh, definitely helps but you have to find your own speed, your own movement, you know, that, that kind of gives you your body, everything, every chance it has to throw far, I guess. And so I've seen guys that are like six, two, I'm six, eight, but in the ring, they are fast, like way faster than I could ever be, you know? And so there's different things that your body will let you do or that you can do to get the maximum distance out. And you just, Everyone's got to figure that out for themselves, but it's that's one of the things I love about the disc. It sounds like everyone has a different way to optimize themselves. Yeah, yeah. Because I hear, you know, I, I was a theater major, so people are like, yeah, it's physics. And I was like, well, I don't know math. So, <laughs> um, like, uh, for, but it is, I understand that. Yeah, it's the physics, the height of the person, the weight, you know, like, you know, people keep saying, like, mass moves mass. And I was like, well, there is a point where your mask is too big, where it doesn't move itself anymore. So yeah. So yeah, some of the stuff you got to figure out yourself. What it becomes a little counterintuitive, right? Yes. Yeah. You went too big. Yeah. What, uh, you know, you, you talk about specifically weight, but what were some other kind of things that you had to optimize in order to get to that, you know, caliber? Um, dealing with injuries was, a, is a, still is a big one, man. I, it's like every year I got something, it seems like, and I remember my first major injury was I was a sophomore in college and I got a herniated disc. Um, and now I have like three of them. And so, um, figuring out what your, what like the ceiling is for your body. Cause I did that in squats, of course. And, and so it's like, well, you know, um, I guess that's where my limit is, you know? And, and so like, I like to work, safely like close to it but I, i'm not gonna go past that anymore 
I feel like there's a point in lifting or, or in training in general where it's like you get to a point and that's where you should stop, but it's hard to figure out what that is, especially when you're young, you know, and you want to see what you can do. And so figuring out those, um, those like points of, if I go over it, then that's actually a bad thing. And, um, that's just helped me, you know, for the longevity of my career, um, being able to bounce back from stuff like that. Yeah. It sounds like that would be a real challenge to self-regulate, you know, your injury, especially you bring up herniated discs. Like that's, that's no small thing. Oh, back pain sucks. Yeah. No fun. <laughs> yeah. And so it's been cool though. Yeah. I've met a really lot of great, uh, physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, and, um, I get my basement. It's like a recovery room. Like he's got foam rollers, Theragun, like uh, Norma tech boots, all this stuff. And, um, yeah, I, I, I really got into it and actually I'm, um, starting massage therapy school this fall just because of all the injuries I've had. And I think I can help people, you know, with that kind of stuff. So it'd be cool. Yeah. And you have to incorporate all these chiropractors and therapists into your training routines as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. Have to. Yeah. I won't, I won't make it through the week. (laughs) (laughs) What, uh, gosh, what, what other injuries have you, you know, had to fight through? I mean, just the back pain I could see as, you know, as an athlete, that's really debilitating. What other kind of things have you kind of run into? Um, a lot of very common like injuries for discus throwers, like his joint stuff. So whether it be weight room or just the amount of times that we've like done the same movement. Um, so like ankles, knees, hips for big guys spinning around uh, and back. Those are like the big ones. I've been lucky uh, to not have much knee issues. I do have some hip, hip stuff um because if i don't know if you if you go look at like a throw and you like slow it down that first move i mean we're we're pivoting that left foot like we're facing this way we're pivoting that left foot like back there so after a while that hip kind of says like okay man what are we doing here <laughs> and like wants to give it up but um other common stuff is just like um you know you get that stretch in your chest and so a lot of people have like pec tears um i've been pretty good with that it's just been, yeah, like ankle injuries. I have a lot of those. Um, yeah, it, there's always injuries coming in your season. I want everyone to know that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's best to kind of get ahead of it, finally, kind of figure out what your body's saying. Like in the morning, sometimes like my back will be oh, – sorry, hold on. No, you're good. Uh, so my back will be like really stiff, and I'm like, well, you know, today I'm not going to squat a lot of weight, you know, and just kind of – figuring that stuff out for yourself and everybody's different. So yeah, just being able to understand that like you're, you're going to adapt and you're going to, you're going to figure it out. For these injuries, what's more common to have them crop up say in training or actually when competing? I think it's pretty rare when you're competing. I've seen it. I've seen people get hurt, you know, like slip and fall, but I don't see a lot of, yeah, I don't know, like those kinds of injuries. Cause I think it's like through most of our injuries are through overuse. And so at a meet, we get six throws that at practice will take, you know, I take about 40 throws at practice, but I've heard people taking like, like over a hundred throws. Uh, and I did that when I was young, but, um, quality yeah. over quantity now. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. And so, um, I think that's mostly the reason why, but yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff at, at meets. Um, I've seen a guy throw and then, uh, his like peck just started bruising up like real bad. And so he tore his peck. I've seen that once, but yeah, like there's, there's just been mostly at, at practices. You're telling me, so you get, you got six throws in the competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the preparation for that is you're throwing 40. Typically for me. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so uh, that's, yeah, it's a good thing to bring up. Yeah. Cause it's kind of 
off balance, it seems. But um, yeah, so most of our practices is like everybody's doing something wrong. Like I've never had a throw where I was just like, oh, I did everything that I possibly could, you know. <laughs> and so um, we spend a lot of time not even working on like setting up like this is the meat, you know. It's like, no, we've got to break these like really minuscule movements because usually we're just looking for like like a one, two or like 3% increase. increase on the other guy. And so, I mean, my wife is a high school throws coach and I help her out. Um, so I coach at, at Mill Valley and yeah, you know, when I'm talking to her about the sort of stuff that I'm working on with coach, you know, she's just like, God, this is just so she's like, it, it almost seems like it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm like, I know. And it really is hard to feel too, you know, when you're spinning as fast as you can. And, and so that's why I would say there's so many throws, you know, at practices, but that's why, like when we get towards championship season, we really cut the number down, you know, it comes you closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And, and so those throws are meant to get the movement pattern down or are they to, build arm strength mm. well there's different things that we will do throughout the year right and so um we don't have so much like arm strength like i said like the the arm is basically like a string it's like when i get it when i get the momentum going and i don't want to ever like flex so i don't want to actually feel my arm like kind of pump up because that it's going to make it slower and like speed beats like whatever power you can produce you know if like i'm moving fast and i just transfer i just give it to what i produce you know it's gonna it's gonna zip but as the second i start you know kind of trying to arm it it's just it slows down like crazy and so um there is like what my coach calls throwing strength though so it's just the ability to like hold the weight without breaking the technique is what he calls throwing strength. So in the fall, we'll throw like heavy discs. So I throw a two kilogram in practice and we'll throw like a 2.5, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it makes a huge difference. It takes off probably about 40 feet in your throw. So it's like a pretty big deal. And I'll, uh, or 20 feet, any, but yeah. Um, and so we'll do that for I would say like arm strength or what I would call throwing strength. And then we'll do certain implements for speed, um, cer certain implements to like work on like the orbit. So like when we start, we'll start like wind up uh, up high. And as it goes, it kind of drops. And when it comes to the middle, it goes up and then drops again and then goes like flat out really fast. So there's, yeah, there's all kinds of really like tedious things you can work on and you can figure it out that out on what you need to and yeah i mean it never ends so <laughs> <laughs> that uh that uh when you yeah. what what's probably the hardest technical aspect of throwing that's interesting it it definitely changes throughout the year i would say right now my toughest technical challenge is when I land so like you, you're spinning you got, you're on one foot and then you land and uh, my right foot comes up slightly before my left foot and I would and like I don't even know if you can tell if you just watch it like full speed <laughs> but I slowly down and it makes it hurt so when I see it my right foot just comes off and my left foot still on the ground I hate looking at it but <laughs> yeah I'd say that's my technical uh the toughest challenge for me. Yeah. That it's interesting. You know, you talk about kind of the training, the differential, the weights, the discus. I know for baseball, there's a overload underload training. We're like, a, mm -hmm. we're not dealing with the same weight here, but like a five baseball is five ounces. You throw yeah. a seven ounce baseball or a three ounce baseball, you know, and it's yeah. that fluidity you're trying to feel as well. You know, and I, I, I do, it does resonate kind of that, like you just want to go bang it or throw it. Right. Yeah. If you can, if you can feel it in your shoulder, pretty good. 
you might not be doing it right. You know? That's exactly right. Like if you feel like you did something aggressive, that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it, it should, that, that inherent transfer to the ball or the discus, that's, that's what you're looking for, that fluidity. If you're very conscious of that action, uh, that's usually you've lost some force there and you've put it into, you say your elbow or, you know, your front leg or something like that. Yeah. And it is very like, just that consciousness is really tough too, right? Just to overcome that, especially at like games or meets. Cause I feel like it's, there's a fine line between that kind of unconscious muscle memory movement and like being lazy. Right. Yeah. For me, I think that's like, a, it's like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to like put too much uh, to make me tense up, but then it's kind of gets lackadaisical and that's like its own rabbit hole of problems. So yeah. Yeah. You, you almost want to be comfortable in a way, but you don't want to be so much actively like thinking that you get rattled. That's what we say, get mentally rattled over things. You know, you want to be like, so nitpicky, uh, thinking about yeah. orientation of things, you know, you can, you can get as de in depth as possible in your own head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, it's definitely, it's, uh, I don't know. It's definitely like hitting like a dartboard, right? You're hitting that, trying to get that bullseye of a little bit of everything and not too much of anything. Yeah. You, you bring up kind of, you know, we're talking kind of the mental aspect to a certain degree. What are some ways that you mentally prepare? Um, I've actually started seeing a sports psychologist in 2020 and he's given me a lot. It's been really cool. Just like breathing techniques. If I'm getting like uh, too much adrenaline at a meet or too pumped up, there's just like these uh, four, like four count in, seven count out. That's just like a little physical thing to like do immediately to help you uh, calm or maintain what you're trying to do. Um. Other mental stuff is, uh, I don't know, there's just like phrases that you can kind of say, we've worked with that a little bit, like uh, at practices, I don't really like, I don't know, it doesn't really affect with me too much, um, but just dealing with that stuff of how to not kind of be overwhelmed with like, the things that we're talking about, like, okay, I need to I need to be relaxed, but I have to have my energy up, but you know, and so uh, there's just so many things like you said that you can think about and it kind of takes you away from the competition. Um, dealing with things like burnout, like I've been throwing since I've been 12, like I'm almost uh, uh, 12 or 11. So yeah, I've almost got 20 years in this um, of the same movement, you know, <laughs> and um yeah, I feel like it's uh, for as long as I've been doing it, it almost feels like a, like a wave, like comes in waves of like, oh, I'm really like kind of down on myself. And then um, it'll just kind of pick back up and I'm like right where, back where I was. So dealing with like those kind of mental drops. Yeah. How how do you deal with those lulls? You know, you bring up the amount of time spent training and, you know, competing and everything in between how do you how do you kind of you find the will to reinvest you know ready back up yeah i it used to be harder but i've done it so much i just know that it's going to be over i'm like wow well, this yeah, like, oh this thing again you know and so yeah i know that it'll come back like this too shall pass and um another really kind of I'm trying to put this. Um, I guess in, in the end, like I just really love throwing. Like I would say, eh, like I got into disc golf um, over the pandemic, and like I could just I could always go out and throw discs. I don't know why, just frisbees, whatever. And so like, um, I don't know. I don't feel like it's like one of those things where I have to like be like Rocky Balboa and drink the eggs and like get up in the morning and go and force myself to do this, you know? So that I, I truly do love it. And I think that's probably what makes it doable or easier to just keep reinvesting and just like, yeah, you know, it didn't work out. Let's just keep going. And, um, 
And I think that's just because, yeah, it's what I love. You, it, it makes it easier if you have a passion for it. Right. Yeah. 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 You can kind of tap back into that ever, ever so now, and you kind of refine that, even though you may have lost it back squatting with uh, three herniated discs. And <laughs> yeah, and it, it, I think it's uh, because the fun part of the disc is the dance, is the movement, and figuring out how, like, whether it be rhythm, position, or intensity, like, there's always something that you can work on to make the discus, like, um, go further in the end. But, you know, depending on what wind you have, you know, it can catch a flight. And, uh, and so that's always fascinating to me. It's interesting enough to, to show up to practice every day. Yeah. Now, throughout this whole thing, there have been a couple of things that have come up that I think would need such as time health, but what sacri- sacrifices have you made in order to compete? Um, sacrifices, man. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I guess there's been things I don't really see as sacrifices is just kind of like, well, that's my path, you know, I'm, I'm doing this thing. So I've been pretty like, I've had the horse blinders on since probably since I knew I wanted to become an Olympian in, in high school. So um, I, I'm just trying to think like, like I was a theater major and I wanted to go to um, Canada and like do the sci-fi thing. That's where they film most of their stuff. I wanted to be like uh, monsters, aliens and a bunch of makeup, you know? And, and, and so I guess I could call that a sacrifice. That I didn't do it. I, I, I just don't, I don't know. I just see like, I, this is what I got to do to get the goal done, you know? And so, um, I would say the sacrifice, the more like obvious sacrifices, just like partying and doing things that would like negatively affect my training. I don't really see those as sacrifices either. Cause I enjoy training more than I would that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now that, you know, brings up kind of something I don't think we've touched on. What, kind of diet do you have to adhere to throughout you know, the process well as i mentioned before i got like went up 100 pounds came down like 110 pounds so i've had a lot of diets um the one that i'm on right now is my favorite it's it works i, I really enjoy it but it's like um high meat uh, or high protein um lower fat than I expected and like medium carb basically. And so like, it's just like four eggs, um, six ounces of some sort of like lean meat and then, um, nuts for breakfast for like a lunch. It'll be a veggie, uh, a lot of meat and potatoes. And then dinner is like another potato, different type of potato, uh, meat and veggie. And that's helped me the most is um, I'm really sensitive to carbs and like processed sugar. I blow up. It's like, it's like a science experiment. It's hilarious. And um, so replacing those with potatoes for some reason, um, it just doesn't stick to me. And so it's nice to finally have something that consistently works. So you're telling me if I were to go and open up your fridge right now, am I going to see like a ton of Tupperware containers or what's going on? I did that for a bit uh the meal prep yeah i did that for a bit um i can't i'm not as consistent i find it easier just to have like the crate of eggs and like uh but you know i buy like three packs of bacon at a time or um we got a lot of deli meat you know and then just uh like bags of salad or like you know those pre-made bags of salad or like different green beans stuff like that and then um yogurts milks uh, dairy products um and then um i got into smoking meats so i've got yeah just different different things in the freezer ready to go what what kind of other diets i guess had you tried to he- adhere to or gone gone oh, yeah. um first weird diet that i did well not weird just uh different uh, not usual not usual and so it was a raw vegan diet where it was like um 
yeah, so you can't cook anything. It's got to be like, uh, it's got to be vegetables or fruit. And you could only eat like one of one thing. So there would be like breakfasts where I would have like 15 bananas and just like that would be it. And that lasted for about three weeks. Um, but I was like dedicated to that. That wouldn't suck though. Uh, I, just, I tried a juice diet. That lasted two days and then steak immediately. <laughs> um, yeah, just I tried all of it. I, yeah, I just wanted to see what works and nothing was consistent until basically it's just like uh, produce and yeah, stay away from packaged items really. I gotta I gotta ask, if there's if there's fifteen bananas for breakfast, what the hell's lunch? <laughs> I uh, there would be like, yeah, it would have uh, like three heads of romaine lettuce and i would just squeeze it and roll it up tight and just like chomp down on it yeah <laughs> oh yeah. my yeah that was a weird diet it, it lost sounds some, lost some weight <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds kind of kind of fun but i'm just like picturing the just 15 bananas like god oh, like, i know how long does it take you to eat it was i mean it took time just cuz I don't know. Like, have you ever been on like banana eight and, and you're, and you're, and you're looking at seven more bananas there and yeah, like, you know, 40 minutes has gone by your jaw hurts, you know? Yeah. It's it's, a, it takes it's a lot. A, it's a little disheartening at that point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But we got through it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, what, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, sacrifices earlier. I think throughout kind of your whole experience as an athlete, what would you say would, is your biggest obstacle? Hmm. Interesting. I feel like that's a moving target too. Well, it has been. Um, currently, Biggest obstacle is, you know what? It's turned into flights. It's flying. I don't fit on the plane. And I used to try, you know, younger Mason would like, I got to go over to Europe and like, they don't pay for like business class or first class, you know, so six, eight, 300, whatever. And yeah, just, I'm starting to get hurt on the planes now just from being like crammed in there, depending on the, how long the flight is. But, like, yeah, you, typically, like, domestically, I'm okay. But, um, yeah, there's just something about, yeah, like, like when I go over to Europe to compete, I'm not, not like, Olympics or uh, championship season, but it's just, like, a regular meet. Um, like, those are, like, nine-hour flights, and I got to compete, like, the next day that I land. <laughs> and, yeah, that's getting difficult, I would say. I would say that uh that's for right now what and so is it just the sheer amount of time just sitting stationary well like like my knees go into like the seat ahead of me and so I, i've got like one of those neck pillows wrapped around one knee and i wrap a blanket around the other one <laughs> and so i'll be stuck like that and then the just where like the the armrests are they like pinch my hips and so like I get like uh, my SI joint gets like thrown out of place. It's like becoming a problem, but um, I, st- I, you know, I, every time I have like one of these problems, I check in with like chiropractors and PTs and they've always got something that you can do to, to kind of like, if I can like stand up on the plane, then I can do like stretches and stuff like that and try to stay, stay healthy. It sounds like that's a tough ordeal too, based upon the immediacy of performance. You know, like mm-hmm. you're you're coming in, and then it's like, all right, I'm stiff tomorrow at yeah. eight a.m. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Well, that's what happened at, this year at trials. I flew out to Oregon, and uh, it was the second day out there, and I practiced, and something went wrong. I don't know what happened with my hip, but then like it, it like kind of shifted, and then you know, that messed up my whole spine and I couldn't throw. And I was out at trials for like 14 days or like somewhere like close to two weeks. Um, And I couldn't throw for like, 
probably 10 days. I was just sitting out there and I was like really afraid. I was like, dang, I don't know if I can actually do this. This is going to get weird, you know, not being able to compete. And I made a really great chiropractor out there and um, he got me back and within like, yeah, with like no time to spare. Yeah. I only had, I think, three practices before I went into that meet. That was very stressful. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. You know, especially you're trying to compete, right? That's what you're there for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it happens. Yeah, you see that stuff all the time. What, What advice would you have for someone that wants to do what you're doing? Um... Let's see. There's a few things, I guess. Um, I think it's really important for me, it was at least, to just remember, like, the love of the sport. For me, is um, I remember kind of shifting to college, and now we're talking about, like, points for the team, you know, so we can win, and there's medals. And then it got to the point where I was becoming a professional thrower, and – worrying about money and, and you got to, you know, everybody, everybody does, but I feel like a lot of that stuff kind of took me down a, a, not the path I wanted to go on and just remembering like, this is just, this is a sport. It's supposed to be fun. You know, I don't need to stress myself, uh, you know, live and die on this, you know, I'm going to do my best and that's all I can do, you know, let the universe take care of the rest and um, just do what you love. Yeah. And that's helped quite a bit. There's a lot of things that you have to do as an athlete that indirectly help you, right? Training, mm-hmm. the diet and all that. And it can be hard to kind of, you kind of disassociate from what you're actually doing it all for, you know, at a certain point. Right. And yeah. that, that can serve yeah. as a challenge, you know, when you're, when you're eating 15 bananas and you're looking down the barrel of six more, it can be hard to kind of think I'm, just, you know, I'm trying to throw something. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. Uh, at the same time, I think you do have to have, especially in like track and field, you have to have this sort of personality where like, I don't know, I guess I would say I've been into like weight rooms when like football players are lifting and the coaches are right up on them. You know, they're like telling them what they exactly need to do. And that's just not the case. Like it's on you and track. Like you got to be the one excited about trying different diets or different training, uh, different rehab. And I, yeah, I would say it, that would be some advice too, is if you want to do this, like you really have to be the type of person that likes to experiment and doesn't, uh, Like, you got to take a chance. Like, this might not work out. Like, you know, 15 bananas might not be a good idea, but I got to try it, you know. (laughs) So you're going to kind of have to have that personality. There's a level of autonomy there and Mm self-regulation. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's huge. Yeah. Because like I said, you know, you don't really have a lot of, like, trainers. I mean, of course you have your coach and, you know, he or she is, like, super crucial and after that though like the support staff of like dietitians stuff like that you got to figure that out for yourself or like go get people to help you you have to seek out that information or seek out people you can include in your support system yeah yeah well mason this has been awesome to hear from you and all your experiences where can people learn more about you? Um, you know, I'm, I'm firing up social media a little bit better. I'm not good, but I'm being forced to now. So <laughs> uh, if they check me out on Facebook or Instagram, the name is Mayfin Picks. Um, you know, I will hopefully have more content for people to check out here pretty soon. All right. Well, it was a pleasure, Mason. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thank you. You try to pull me from this cold wind and spark the flame that's left and gone. That wraps up our conversation with Mason Finley. We talked about the difficulty of overcoming injuries, various types of training, such as weightlifting, plyometrics, and stretching. 
and the sheer amount of time you have to dedicate to an activity. Follow Mason on Facebook by simply searching his name and on Instagram by using the handle at Mayfinpix, M-A-Y-F-I-N-P-I-C-S. Check out Mad Libby. Their music is on Apple and you can find information at madlibby.com. And lastly, don't forget to subscribe to the Simple Questions podcast on your preferred platform so you get a notification for every new episode once it's out. Speaking of new episodes, the next episode is currently being edited and will be released on the first Tuesday of October. I'm going to try and be a little bit more consistent for now on and release on the first Tuesday of every month. So look forward to that new episode once it is out. Thank you for listening. And remember, keep asking questions.